to give you my crown would signify a change of leadership. So says the law of this land. It also says that the crown is to be worn only by those with the highest regard and intent for Daventry. So to give it to such a vile being as you would betray the honor and memory of all the past kings who have worn it. No, I will not do it. Not even for the sake of your family? There are some principles for which even one's family must be sacrificed. The man appraises you as a scientist would a unique specimen. What an intriguing set of morals you have, King Graham. I almost look forward to the time when you will put aside your obligations here and seek me out. I have foreseen that we shall meet again. Behold your third test. Once again, you feel yourself age. You are many years older now, though still, thankfully, King of Daventry. As before, the knowledge of the previous test ebbs from your mind. This time, however, it is filled with a greater knowledge of all that has come to pass thus far. Many years have passed. Your children, once heirs to your throne, have forged their own paths in other kingdoms. Fortunately, chance has seen fit to fill the vacuum. Following the restoration of the Mask of Eternity, Daventry now has a new champion. How do you feel? I am deeply honored, sire. All right. Now, how do you really feel? Scared out of my wits, sire. You smile and feel the lines in your face stretch. You hope you'll get used to it when the true time comes. You know what they've been saying about my decision, that is. The people question my ability to perform the duties when I have another higher obligation. I believe that I can attend to both with the utmost equity. You do not deny that this obligation may arise at any moment, perhaps taking you away from this country at a time of great need? Of course not, sire. But I shall deal with that troll, as they say, when I cross that bridge. And there is the matter of you not being of royal birth. That does not sit comfortably with some of the nobles. The qualities of truth, light, and order can shine from even the most impoverished of souls. Nobility is defined through one's actions, not one's lineage, your majesty. You cannot help but smirk. For a man who had once lived as a peasant, he speaks extremely well. I have carefully thought over the matter put before me. It is true that I no longer have a residing heir to carry on in my place. However, I cannot place the future of this kingdom in the hands of one who, while possessing great skills, courage, and virtues, may not be able to serve her with singular devotion. Go back to your village, Connor. Yes, sire. Despite his gracious acceptance, you sense that Connor has been dealt a rather severe moral blow. In an instant, you find yourself standing before the Cloud Spirit once more. You also notice that it is starting to get dark. You have demonstrated some understanding of compassion, honor, and loyalty. These attributes transcend the mind and speak of the soul within you. Growth continues unabated throughout the lives of all living things. While you still have much to learn, you will continue to grow in all ways. You are judged worthy of the air and growth gem. You take the growth gem. As you feel the knowledge of the last test fade from your mind, the cloud beneath your feet begins to evaporate. You'd better get out of here quickly, Graham.
Finally, your flight comes to an end. You hope that it will be quite a while before you take to the air again. Where would you like me to land? On the ground would be fine. Take this sugar cube. It will protect against the poisonous growth of this land. Fare thee well. As dusk sets in and the pallid moon rises above the darkened horizon, you recall the door of destiny's words regarding the third gem, through swampy mire, in lone dark castle. Then you remember the great Neptune's disquiet reluctance to speak of Kalima's lord. You sense a growing unease that this final gem may not be the easiest to acquire. Finding the door unlocked and unbarred, you enter the church. You notice a Bible on the end of a pew. You look over the Bible, which appears to be many decades old. You open it and find that an otherwise blank page at the front has been written on. It is dated over 20 years ago. You return the Bible to where you found it. You also notice that a page from the Bible has fallen onto the floor. You pick up the fallen page and read it. The words appear to have been written recently. Something wicked started war. Shame nobody ever saw. Feeling humbled, you kneel down to pray. You rise again after a few moments. The monk stirs, stands, and turns to face you. Father, I go now to a place of darkness. While I am stout of heart, the path laid down before me is unclear. I seek only the knowledge that my passage be illuminated by heavenly favor, and a prayer that I may make it through. The monk gives you a reassuring smile and pats you on the shoulder. He then lifts a silver cross from around his neck and places it in your hands. Thank you. You are welcome, my child. You can talk? Of course. I thought monks were forbidden from speaking. Not all churches follow the same rules, and this church is quite unique. Really? How so? The monk just smiles placidly at you. About this crucifix. I believe you will find the cross to be of immense value. It has come to us at a huge price. It was expensive? I mean that it has cost us more than any value to be in possession of it. One is meant to speak from a pulpit. If I may ask, why is it that you only open the church at dusk? Ah, huh, we find the late hours more favorable. But surely then you would not have many in your congregation. Yes, that is true. One is meant to... What do you know of the Count? Only that he is a heathen, a blasphemer. You serve God well by going there, my child. Bless you. The monk smiles at you, turns back to the altar, kneels, and resumes his prayers. <laughs> 